Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Peter said, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. John said, do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. If you keep what they have said in mind, shouldn't, should it surprise us then that Tony Dungy is being raked over the coals by, at the hands of the media because he would dare to say anything about drafting Michael Sams? By the way, Michael Sams is the first openly homosexual NFL player, at least has been drafted. And, and Tony Dungy said that he, would not, he wouldn't have drafted Michael Sams because he wouldn't want the media circus that surrounded him. Does it surprise us then that the Muslims in Iraq have given Christians three different options if they wish to stay at their home? They can either convert to Islam, they can pay up, or they can die. Does it surprise us then that the American evangelist Tony Milano, or Miano, I should say, was arrested in London for simply proclaiming that homosexuality was a form of immorality? Does it surprise us then that Brooks Hamby, a high school senior in California, was told to censor out of his graduation speech any reference to God or religion? Does it surprise us that Walter uh, Tutka, a teacher in New Jersey, was fired for giving a, a student a Bible? Are we surprised that a Florida teacher called the parents of a 12-year-old boy and informed them that he could no longer read his Bible during free time at school? Are we surprised that a Christian baker is facing government investigation after he refused to make a cake that portrayed two Sesame Street characters as gay lovers? We live in a world and we live in a country that is becoming increasingly hateful toward any Christian. Any Christian who actually lives out what they believe, I should say. But that being said, I want you to understand the, the attacks on the church don't just come from without. Lots of times they come from within. Let me illustrate that with that old joke. Maybe you've heard it before. How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? What do you mean change a light bulb? My parent, parent, my grandparents gave that light bulb. Change? What? Or maybe you've experienced this. A church on the other side of town suddenly begins to have great success as they minister and grow for the Lord. And what do other Christians in the community do? Do they celebrate their success and rejoice? No. So often they say, well... They must have sold out to have that kind of success. They must have compromised their message. The world hates us. At work, they may hate you because you don't steal from the company by taking extra long breaks or lunch hours. At school, they may hate you because you refuse to go along with the crowd and instead stand up for what is right. Your so-called friends may hate you because you refuse to participate in drinking or some other activities or events that would tarnish your reputation as a Christian. The truth is, we are going to be attacked as Christians. When you shine in the darkness, be ready for people to hate you for it. We are right in the middle of a sermon series I've entitled Spiritual Investments. And we are looking at ways of living our life so that God rewards us. Things that God sees as important and valuable for us to do. And as we do that this morning, I want you to understand that being attacked for God is an activity that he rewards. Being attacked for your Christianity, being attacked because you stand for Christ is something that God rewards. So I'd like us to take a closer look at that this morning. Why does God reward a life that is being attacked for him? 
Well, the first thing you have to understand is you are attacked because your witness is strong. Now, I want you to turn me to Luke chapter 6. You are attacked because your witness is strong. Luke chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. I want you to listen closely to what Jesus says there. Jesus says, your attackers are following the example of their fathers, and their fathers hated the prophets. Now we have to understand what a prophet is. A prophet was someone who stood up and spoke up for God. And often they did that in the face of great opposition. They were God's timely messengers. They were proclaimers of truth. They often called for repentance of their nation. They wanted them to be renewed and come back to God. And for those very reasons, the world often hated them. The world attacked them. Sometimes the world killed them. But God loved them. And God rewarded them. And God quite often protected them from those attacks. Jesus says they will hate you. They'll exclude you. They'll insult you. They'll reject you because you are living a strong witness for me. And that will be rewarded. That will be rewarded. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. When people are upset by the proclamation of truth, we should be excited because Jesus says, hey, they're not just upset, they're hearing the good news. It can be a very costly thing to live our life for Christ. But if we're willing to pay the price the message of Jesus will be heard. People will hear the gospel message if we're willing to pay the price of being attacked for what we believe. A second century believer in a letter to a friend, Diagnosti, Di, Digos, Dognosti, oh, I can't think of his name. It starts with a D. Some guy back in the second century. He, he received a letter. Anyway, in that letter, it was described how Christians are alike and different from others. This is what he says. He says, though they are residents at home in their own countries, their behavior there is more like transients. Though destiny has placed them here in flesh, they do not live after the flesh. Their days are passed on earth, but their citizen, citizenship is above in the heavens. They ob obey the prescribed laws, but their own private lives, they transcend the law. They show love to all men, and all men persecute them. They are misunderstood and condemned, yet any suffering, yet by suffering death they are quickened into life. They are poor, yet making many rich, lacking all things, yet having all things in abundance. They repay curses with blessings and abuse with courtesy. For the good they do, they suffer stripes as evildoers. When the world sees our witness, they often respond with hatred. But when God sees our witness, he always responds with reward. The real question we have to ask ourselves is, what are people seeing in us? Do they see our love for Jesus? Do they see a life lived for him or something else? The second thing we need to understand is that you are attacked so that you can love like God. Now back in Luke chapter 6, verses 35 through 36, it says this. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Now Jesus tells us, that when you're attacked, recognize it's an opportunity. When someone attacks you for your belief, recognize it's an opportunity. 
It's an opportunity to, to embrace them. It's an opportunity to love them, Jesus says. This goes directly against our nature. And that is exactly what God expects us to do. Go against your nature. Love those who hate you. Compliment those who insult you. Be generous with those who extort you. That's what he starts off with. Jesus talking about loving our neighbors. He starts off with these things. Chapter 6, verses 27 through 31. But I tell you, I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, if anyone takes, ask you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. God rewards a life that is being attacked for him because God wants us to love the world, to demonstrate to them the, the lengths we will go to love them and provide for them and care for them, just like his son did. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. God has showed us the cost of loving us. And then he calls us to pay the same price. Why do I have to pay the price, we may ask? What price will I have to pay to love others? See, when we, we are attractive to others when we love like Jesus loved. When we show them the same sacrifice that Jesus showed us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the cost of discipleship, he wrote this. He says, the cross is laid on every Christian. As we embark upon the discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. The cross is not a terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. We have to ask ourselves, why are we surprised when people want to kill us for our faith? Isn't that exactly what we've signed up for? Jesus died at the hands of his attackers. And while, the, while they were crucifying on the cross, poking fun at him, putting him through agony and misery, the entire time, what does he show them? He shows them eternity-altering love. He shows them a love that will save their souls if they can grab hold of it. He even asks for his attackers to be forgiven in the midst of them attacking him. What about you and me? When we are attacked for our faith, what does our response say about the God we serve? Are people experiencing his love through us? Or are they only receiving our judgment and our vengeance and our retaliation? We are to love our enemies in the hope that they won't stay that way. We are to love our enemies in the hope that they will respond to the love of Christ. The world is going to hate you. But this is a good thing. That means that they're seeing your witness. And that hopefully means that they're feeling God's love through you. In August... <clears throat> August, or excuse me, in April, I should say, April 28, 1999, eight days after the Columbine shootings, shock rock singer Marilyn Manson was scheduled to perform a concert in Iowa City, Iowa. And since Manson's music was a prominent force in the lives of the Columbine killers, there was a lot of emotion that surrounded this concert. Mark Forstrom, a local youth minister in the area, wrote about what happened. And this is what he wrote. He wrote, he wrote this. He said, the police, the media, and the community began to prepare for angry protest and ugly brawling between Christians and Marilyn Manson supporters. But suddenly something totally unexpected happened. Emerging through the vehicle of email, another local movement suddenly sprang to life. <clears throat> that the only way to truly change our moral climate is to soften hard hearts. 
The hearts of Manson fans have been hardened by their perception that Christians are mean-spirited, hateful, and judgmental. Thus the idea was birthed to unravel that stereotype by encouraging Christians to show the pure love of Christ to these fans in tangible ways. When the concert day finally arrived, the tension filled the community and the media geared up for an ugly battle between Manson fans and the Christian opposition. But instead they observed an amazing testament to the power of the love of Christ. Scores of Christians from churches all over Lynn County and as far away as Des Moines converged on the sidewalks outside the Five Seasons Center to do two positive things, pray and show unmistakable love. It was a sight to behold, he said. Groups conducted prayer walks around the arena. People prayed and huddled on the sidewalk. Churches around the city held special prayer meetings. And as for showing love for the fans, one church purchased a hundred pizzas, which they freely gave away to the fans in line. Cookies and over 12,000 cans of soda were purchased and donated. Someone made turkey and cheese sandwiches and gave them away. One minister asked Manson fans who passed by how he could pray for them, and about 20 of them shared specific things, and he prayed for them right on the spot. <clears throat> After the concert, about $200 in cash was collected by a local youth group, and it was given out to pay the parking. The Christians involved said, We're Christians, and we'd like to show you God's love by paying for your parking tonight. And the, and the immediate result of this love and actions Action was phenomenal. People continually asked, why are you doing this? And then they listened as they were given an answer. Two live radio reporters, one inside the stadium and one outside, discussed on the air how preferable it was to be outside with the generous Christians. At least three people gave their lives to Christ through the loving care of Christians. At least one fan that, uh, that we know of chose not to go to the concert and ended up in church in the following Sunday. After getting the pizza, one kid commented, Wow, Marilyn Manson never gave me anything. A Marilyn Manson's website admitted, So maybe those Christians aren't half bad. And as for the concert itself, we saw God work a miracle there as well. After only an hour, Manson ab abruptly ended the concert early. He suddenly flew into a rage. He threw his microphone to the ground. He stormed off the stage and he never returned. So to summarize the totality of the Marilyn Manson's visit to Cedar Rapids, we might say this. Many fans came to the concert convinced that Christians were irritating and that Manson was impressive. And many left the concert feeling that Marilyn Manson was irritating and that Christians were impressive. What would the concert fans say about you and me? If we were in charge of that event, what would they say? Would God have gotten glory if we were in charge? Or would hate have billowed from our lives? When the world is comes at us with hatred and attack, we should respond with love as we stand for the truth so that we can win them to the Lord. In Romans 12, verse 21, it says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good.